Hello, Alex here, and today we're going to talk about my first roll of Ilford's SFX 200 infrared sensitive black and white film, which I shot in 35mm format in the Canon EOS 1V. Let's get into it. Ilford SFX 200 is a black and white negative film which is designed for development in the standard black and white chemical process. Naturally, Ilford recommend their own DDX developer, but you can use just about anything else depending on what's available and you probably have to just adjust the times and temperatures accordingly. The film is rated at ISO 200 in the visible spectrum and each canister contains 36 exposures and the canisters are DX coded for automatic ISO detection, but as we'll get to later, that only really applies if you use it as a normal black and white film. It is available in both 35mm and 120 formats, but unfortunately not sheet film, which is a bit disappointing. As this is a negative film, you will have to invert your photos either during the scanning or printing process to achieve your final positive image. The emulsion is coated onto a grey acetate base as opposed to a clear polyester base, which means that the film is not so subject to light piping, which is a great thing, and it's quite resistant to the typical halations that you see with a lot of infrared photography, which may or may not be to your taste. So all in all, it sounds pretty normal so far. So what's special about this film? This is a super panchromatic film. Super meaning extreme or beyond, pan meaning all or complete, chromatic meaning color, and emia meaning presence in blood. No, super panchromatic, beyond all of the colors. This film can see beyond the visible light spectrum well into the infrared. According to Ilford, panchromatic film, as in regular black and white film, usually cuts off at about 650 nanometers. The sort of accepted definition of where red light stops being red light and starts being infrared light is about 700 nanometers. This film can see up to about 740 nanometers, so well beyond a normal panchromatic film. If you use this film with an infrared filter, which will block visible light but allow infrared light to pass, you get these crazy effects where the brightness of your subject is determined not by its color, but by its reflectivity of infrared light. The two most dramatic examples being the sky, which does not reflect or scatter infrared light, so appears quite dark on a clear day, and foliage, where the chlorophyll does reflect a huge amount of infrared light, so your foliage goes extremely bright white when shooting infrared. The consequence of using this infrared filter is that you're blocking out the visible light. You're blocking out a lot of light that's available out in the world. So you have to shoot at a lower effective ISO. You know, you're adding stops of exposure compensation. I shot this roll at ISO 5 to give you an idea. I shot my first roll of SFX 200 in the Canon EOS 1V with the original version of the EF 24-70mm f2.8 L. I chose this camera, as I mentioned in a previous video, because the internal LED does not fog infrared film, and I chose the lens because A it's a zoom, B it has four separate focusing indices for helping focus infrared light. We'll talk about all this sort of stuff about the special considerations for infrared shooting in a separate video once I've shot the third infrared stock that I want to get my hands on, and I've got a better feel of the different things you need to be aware of. I used a Hoya R72 filter in 77mm diameter to block out the visible light and allow the infrared light to exclusively pass through onto the film. All of these shots were taken on a tripod using a cable release and again rated at ISO 5, so quite long exposures, especially when there was a little bit of shade. That said, I did shoot this roll of film on a bright sunny day, so most of the pictures are in pretty harsh direct sunlight. 
I developed the film in DDX at 1 plus 9 for 15 minutes at 20 degrees Celsius. As I do with all of my black and white film, I scanned it with the 1DX Mark III and the 100mm macro lens and then just inverted the curves in Lightroom. While this isn't exclusive to this particular film, the infrared look is beautiful. As you can see with these pictures in this video, it didn't work out in every shot for me. You need very harsh sunlight and ideally a very clear sky or at least very clear where the clouds aren't. You know what I mean? You want like traditionally cartoony fluffy clouds, ideally. But when it works, it works so well. It's just something totally different to how we see the world and that alone makes it worth it for me. The cost. At €9.50 a roll in 120 and €10.50 in 135, it's, you know, it's not a cheap film, but for an infrared film, I think that's pretty okay. And in addition to that, you can probably get it cheaper online. Those are just my local prices. It's very versatile. If you just take off the infrared filter, rate it at ISO 200, it's a normal black and white film. You're not committing to the infrared look for an entire roll like you would be with the subject of next week's video. This film is really grainy. It completely caught me off guard. I didn't expect it to be so grainy. But I've looked at pictures of this and other infrared sensitive black and white films in larger formats like 120 and 4x5 and they're really grainy too so I think that's just something to do with the interaction of the silver halide with infrared light. I'm not sure, I'm gonna look into it more, but it's weird. It did catch me off guard, now that's not to say it's a problem, it's probably you know around a 400 to 800 speed films worth of grain, probably closer to 800. That's fine for an 8x10 or slightly larger print if you're using a sharp lens, which you probably are, and if you're shooting infrared, you're probably shooting at a narrow aperture anyway. While the film isn't that expensive, infrared filters are. My 77mm Hoya R72 cost me well in excess of 100 euros because that's a big filter. Now fine, it won't be as expensive if you're using smaller filter thread lenses like a 52mm Nikon AIS set. But that's still to be noted. It's not as cheap as like a UV filter or a basic yellow filter. And that is an expense that will put a lot of people off infrared photography, quite justifiably. <laughs> Lastly, and this is very niche, I do admit, but because the film base is that grey acetate rather than a clear base, this film is pretty much completely unsuitable for reversal processes to generate slides because with a slide you want a clear base to give you your pure white highlight when you illuminate the slide. With this, you're not going to get that. Next, we're going to go through my three favourite pictures from this roll in our deep dive. So this is my third favourite picture from the roll. I love the composition because it's quite layered. You have obviously the lake and the reflection of the fountains which are slightly softened by the longish exposure. The trees which are this beautifully white colour with the dark shadows. And then you have like layers of wisps in the clouds and I think it just works nicely. It's layered quite well. I shot this at about 70mm on the 24-70 to and I think that was a good idea because it gave me a good bit of compression from across the lake but I did shoot deliberately leaving space on the left hand side of the frame because I didn't like the view through the viewfinder if I had this large tree and the two sets of fountains dead center. It didn't work that well. All in all, it's relatively simple. There's a lot going on but it's not too busy and it works quite nicely and it was exposed well overall. Okay, this is my second favourite picture from the roll, and it's one of my favourite pictures I've ever taken. It's extremely simple, not quite into the realm of abstraction, but it works really well all the same. 
there's a lot of detail in the clouds. You know, you can still see that it, the clouds are in 3D, which is nice, but the sky is nearly pure black. The one thing I really don't like about this picture is there is a single wisp that you could barely see in visible light that looks like a bad cloning job in the final image. I've tried to get rid of it, doesn't really work. And I promise it's not actually me cloning out dust or anything like that. This was a very clean negative that needed very little work. But at the same time, I would like to print this nice and big. I think it works just so well. It's so simple and yet it works. It exemplifies everything about infrared photography. You have this immensely high contrast with a lot of detail and it turns a fairly mundane shot of, you know, a cloud against the sky into something much more dramatic and intense. This is by far my favorite shot of the roll. You've already seen that I took two pictures here while the Lewis was passing. This was such an intense setup, okay? I was there for about 40, 45 minutes, getting ready, composing, recomposing. I missed a Lewis at one point. I forgot to plug in the cable release. And then another time I missed another because I forgot to put the filter on the lens while I was recomposing. This was at 24 millimeters. F16, I think 0.4 seconds, and it just works so well. I mean, you can see obviously the ghost of the Lewis passing into the frame. It's cut off between where you can see it and can't see it by this large, I don't know, beam of the suspension bridge. Um, all of these lines converge on the tower itself, which surround, is surrounded by the clouds, which works really nicely. And then the shadows of these converge on the fence, which again leads up to the tower. So I think everything, despite being a very busy frame, everything directs you kind of down to this lower third eventually. Uh, and that draws your eye in with the Lewis, like the Lewis is going in the same direction as your eye. I think that works really nicely. And it's a good example of how you can get a nice infrared shot without having foliage in your frame. This is just concrete, tarmac, steel, and sky. And it works really nicely in that regard. I spent a lot of time planning this shot and I'm glad it worked out. I'd love to try this again in 120 just to see how it would compare, but I'm very, very happy with this. And I hope you like it too. This is easy. If you want to get into infrared film photography, Buy this film and a Hoya R72 filter. This combination is very well understood. You shoot at ISO 5, 6, maybe 3 if you want to overexpose a bit and just err on the side of a denser negative if you don't know how to meter that well, especially if you're metering for grass. It's very easy to get good or at least acceptable results with this filter and film combination. And for that reason, it makes a good introduction to infrared film photography. I think I do. I love it, but I haven't shot any other black and white infrared film stocks to compare to yet. So I don't really have any experience with this, but it is a good introduction. As I've mentioned, it's a really nice film. It's quite cheap here. Not the cheapest. You can get it for a good price. You can use it as a normal black and white film. You know, you're not committing, you know, you could easily borrow an infrared filter from someone and just bracket your shots in a sense with and without the filter and just get a feel for it while using most of the roll as a normal black and white roll. So in that sense, it could be worth a try if you know someone who you can borrow an IR filter from. So thank you for sticking to the end of this video where we talked about my first roll of Ilford's SFX 200 infrared sensitive black and white negative film. If you like this video and enjoy what I do, please consider subscribing or donating to my Patreon starting at just one euro per month. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at Shaka1277, where I post new pictures every single day. As I already alluded to, there will be another video coming out next week where we're going to talk about another infrared film, this time Kodak's Aerochrome. We're going to wrap this video up with a sample gallery of the rest of the pictures from the roll. Not all of which I am sharing because they're being saved for another video. Apologies for that. But stay safe and I'll see you next week. Bye bye for now.